Hello and welcome back to the workshop for part two of the Vetterli story. Now part one focused on the background history and a very very in-depth look at the mechanics. Part two uh, we're going to look at the evolution of the infantry rifles uh, through the various patterns, uh, have a quick brief look at uh, the ammunition and we'll also do some shooting. Um, if you have come straight from part one, um, I sincerely hope uh, you had a pee break and grabbed a coffee and I salute you for your perseverance. So, without further ado, let's go. So before we dig into the actual issued rifles, I thought it'd be interesting to have a look at what was initially proposed in 1867 for testing by Vetterli. So this is a curious mix still of uh, the Winchester and uh, homegrown designs. So we have uh, the external hammer with lock work, which is very, very similar to the Winchester. Tube mag, of course, the lifter. We have the all important uh, L-shaped lever arm here to transmit the uh, movement from the bolt to the lifter and then the bolt is actually pretty much there with the exception of course that it doesn't have an internal mainspring. Now if we look at the lifter it's pretty much developed as well. We don't have the little scoops at the back to assist in flipping out cases. Um, as to the bolt as I said um, we we don't have an internal mainspring, so the firing pin is just floating. Still in two parts. We have three locking lugs on the, the locking hub. And there's absolutely no evidence of the primary extraction system that uh, I tried so hard to explain in part one. Uh, of course, that system only works due to having uh, a mainspring here at the back. And I'm wondering whether the poor performance of this in testing was in part due to that, because of course on uh, the proper lever action you have the lever here which gives you immense mechanical advantage when working the bolt and hence extracting. Whereas here uh, we only have this tiny sticky out bolt handle and with that you have to extract and also recock the action. So um, my hypothesis is that's one of the reasons why he had the, such a drastic redesign. So we'll start with the one that hopefully most people will recognize from part one. Uh, this is the uh, model of 1869-70, so what I consider the first general issue rifle um, after the prototypes and trials. And it has most of the features that will stay, uh, apart from changes in style, and a couple of extra things which r disappear rather rapidly, like this loading gate. It's simply a piece of spring steel, and it's retained in place simply by its own tension. Then we have a magazine cutoff, which was popular in uh, practically all early repeating rifles. Um, I explained the function in part one, so I won't go into that again, but uh, that's going to disappear rather quickly. And we should also have a, um, a sort of clamping, sliding dust cover for the ejection port. Uh, this is usually missing because it can just come off rather easily and rather quickly withdrawn as well. So it's, uh, even though it should have one, it's not surprising that it's long gone. Uh, I have a replica on, an, uh, on a later pattern, so we can have a look at that later. Now you can see also there are two holes here. These are gas vents in case of case rupture, which was not unusual back in those days. The Swiss had some difficulty in perfecting their cartridge manufacturing uh, technology. Uh, also bear in mind that since it's a rimfire case, it needs to be relatively thin um, and it's a reasonably powerful cartridge to be a rimfire case so um, it's not surprising that they they provided for the eventuality of having some uh, case ruptures. Now the rest is uh, pretty much standard. The bayonet is at this point the same one that they used for the uh, 1863 percussion rifles there is a slightly later variant specific to the Vetterli and it, the only difference is in a slight thickening of uh, this webbing here, but uh, you really need to measure to see it. Uh, I have two of these. One of them might be a dedicated Vetterli one, but I can't tell without getting a micrometer out. Now, one distinctive feature of this pattern is the, um, what are called badderly bands. 
So the barrel bands, as you can see here, are pretty thick uh, when they sort of protrude from the forend. And if you compare that to the general later pattern we have here, which has um, sort of machined away the excess material. So these are for all three. Well, two, I should say. And the nose cap is square, or squared off. Now I mention this because it wasn't always the case. Um, the very early pattern, so before the, the sort of general issue ones, there was a uh, 1868 pattern, which has a nice sort of uh, eight, 1950s space age curved um, end cap. It also has a uh, sort of curved egg-shaped um, bolt cap. I assume they got rid of both because they were hard to get a grip of. They don't have a nice knurled ring. Also, the very early patterns had the bayonet, uh, sorry, the uh, ramrod mounted on the side. So rather like a cropper check. So it would be going through the barrel bands here and would be screwed into a little extension poking out of the side of the receiver. And one other thing the very early models had um, was the forend mounted with a band spring rather than this key. And you can imagine how well retained that was. So next we come to one of the most common ones for, for collectors nowadays, a model of 1869-71, which is basically a rationalized version of the, the previous one. So gone is the loading gate, gone also is the magazine cutoff, and any rifles that have it, get it taken off. So it's not uncommon and it's perfectly fine to have a rifle with the receiver fitted for all, with all the holes and slots for those two parts and then to be no longer present. That would be its as issued state. Uh, here is the reproduction of the uh, dust cover for the ejection port. Now, um, as you can see, it's not quite long enough. If I put it in sort of mid position, you see there's a bit of a gap at the front and at the back. Uh, this is no fault of mine. The, the length of this is dictated by the length of the receiver here at the, at the back. And it's actually too short to I think, completely seal off. I mean, it'll seal from snow and things like that. But uh, um, this is another feature that uh, smacks to me of Vetterly doing the utmost minimum. Someone wanted a dust cover, so he did it kind of just. Uh, we still have the uh, vents here for ruptured cases. This uh, disappears from 1877. So if you've got one of these, you can sort of date it with, uh, with that cutoff. If it's produced before, it'll have them. If not, it won't. Uh, the dust cover itself is uh, withdrawn from 1875. So it's also not unusual to have a rifle with this removed. Um, actually, if you do work the action with it still in place, it will just fly off. So I um, wouldn't be surprised if many were lost in the tall grass by doing that. Now, one other major feature, you know, I'm gonna remove this screw. Not easy doing all this one-handed. There we go. Is that we now have a separate plate for mounting the pivot arm for the lifter. Before, on the previous model, it was part of uh, the plate with the trigger guard, so you had to remove the trigger guard and everything. Now, you just remove the cross screw and you can just drop out the unit for cleaning. Another thing that's been added is a little peg on the underside of the sight leaf. This means that we now have, it's now fixed at the minimum setting of 225 meters. Uh, the previous site was also also had this minimum setting. However, what could happen was if you applied too much pressure on the site leaf, uh, it would break uh, the little slotted connection between uh, the leaf and its uh, mounting arms here, which has actually happened on the earlier rifle on mine. As for the rest, 
uh, largely unchanged. As I mentioned, uh, the barrel bands now have this curved milled shape here where the, uh, where the tightening screw is, and that remains then standard for the rest. Okay, so now we have the 1871 Stutzer. I've got it here underneath the 1869-71 pattern, infantry rifle. And uh, it's quite ironic that this whole modernization thing started uh, with the intention of arming the uh, sharpshooters and they actually came up second when it came to getting their specific rifle. So, uh, as you can see, it's a little bit shorter. They've shortened the barrel by six centimeters. Uh, the consequence of that is that we have one less cartridge in the magazine. Uh, they've decided that one barrel band is actually enough with a sling swivel. Um, shorter, lighter, uh, a bit handier. These are the sharpshooters that are supposed to be um, sort of having independence on the battlefield, going through scrub, woodland, um, shooting around, crawling around rocks and that kind of thing. So slightly shorter rifle is, is a good thing. Now in terms of the mechanism, it's absolutely identical inside. Uh, what they have done is modified the sights a little bit to make it uh, a little bit easier to aim. And these, these changes are retroactive. Uh, what they've done is they've increased the angle of the rear sight here from uh, 30 degrees to uh, 45. And they've got a uh, U-shaped sight notch now as opposed to the V. And also the front sight is slightly thinner and taller, so it's trying to give you uh, a better sight picture. Now the other notable things are here at the back. We have a, a nice curved butt plate now, which you can uh, tuck in nicely under your armpit, give you a little more stability. And we have the set triggers, beloved of the uh, sharpshooters. Now I do have a separate video entirely on the evolution of these, so I'll put that in the description. And I'll just show you what it looks like and briefly explain how it works. Uh, it is a very nice self-contained system. Um, it's a kind of a cyclic mechanism. This big bar here is actually a spring and it's pushing down on the rear trigger, which is the trigger that is setting the mechanism, like so. And so the spring here is pushing down. When you pull it, and it's the rear trigger is held in place by the front trigger. So when you pull the front trigger, which is the normal conventional trigger, is going to trip the rear trigger, which is under pressure from this spring, and on the front of this trigger is a little bar that's going to smack the rear end of the front trigger and basically accelerate your trigger pull. So you just need to touch it. And when you do it for real, let's see if I can do that. There we go. And it's cocked. Trigger there, and really it's a you know gnat's fart type pressure to fire it. Um, I must say that none of the Vetterli triggers is terrible, even the infantry ones are pretty good. And <clears throat> this little screw here allows you to adjust the overlap when you set the trigger. So it's the overlap between the front trigger and the rear trigger, it just dictates how much movement there is prior to tripping the front trigger. So now we come to the model of 1878 infantry rifle, which saw mainly some cosmetic upgrades or changes. Um, what they have kept from uh, the 1871 is one barrel band now, just for the sling swivel. Uh, so that was enough after all. Uh, they have got rid of the checkering, so it was a, an unnecessary luxury. And the most notable redesign is of the rear sight, and this is due to 
Mr. Rudolf Schmidt himself, who has started dabbling in the Vetterli. Now, the minimum site setting is the same, 225 meters, but we now go all the way up to 1200 meters. And we no longer have any gas ports because uh, this is uh, produced starting one year after they were abolished. Internals remain the same. We have a redesign of the trigger guard. Uh, this is actually pretty much the initial design that uh, Vettelli put forward with his 1867 prototype. And now finally we have a curved butt plate also for the infantry rifles. The other major change is to the bayonet. Instead of having a socket bayonet, we now have this huge uh, sword bayonet, sort of pioneer's knife and bayonet and sword all in one. Uh, we have a, a blade on the front and we have this double saw back on the rear, uh, which is actually the same profile as you'll find on a Swiss Army knife. And uh, it is equally as lethal for a wood and I'm pretty sure bone as well. So uh, yes, this is obviously much heavier than a uh, socket bayonet. So as a consequence, we have a modified nose cap, which is now no longer secured by a barrel band, but we have a screw now going all the way through. And the nose cap now has the uh, bayonet mount on it. So these are the last two models I want to show you and I'll show you side by side because they are basically identical. This is the model 1881 infantry rifle and Stutzer. Now the only difference between them is simply that the Stutzer has its set trigger of course. Otherwise they are identical in length, uh, sights, function. Now this one is the rifle marked M1881. This one does not have anything because this is a uh, rifle made for a private customer. It's made at Waffenfabrik Bern, but it doesn't have a serial number. And since I'm zoomed in, I can see that I forgot to tell you one improvement uh, on the uh, 1878 model, and that is the presence of these dowels here in the stock. Um, obviously, they had some, some trouble prior with some splitting. Uh, there's a fairly deep cutout in the stock for the tangs, so uh, they put these hardwood dowels across the wrist there to stop any cracks. So um, I'll take a look at the set trigger in a second because that's been modified and we also have a slightly modified rear sight. So let's take a look at that. So here we have the modified 1881 sight. Uh, the sight base remains the same. We still have a minimum of 225 meters and a maximum of 1,200 meters. But they obviously decided that uh, the cartridge had a practical accuracy that could go a little bit further. Uh, by the way, the cartridge didn't change over the, uh, the black powder era. There was a couple of changes to the bullet in terms of where the, the uh, grease grooves are, the uh, shape of the, uh, the cavity but the weight remained the same and so did the powder charge so it wasn't really a uh, sort of a ballistic overhaul at any point it was just they they thought they could you know have a practical accuracy further than uh, initially thought so um, what they've done here is uh, that they thought they could get an extra 400 meters out of it and to reach that distance they have made a telescopic rear sight this is a set, this is mr schmidt's design and the way you'd use it is you set your increment here relative to the fixed sight. So if we take uh, 1500 meters there, a bit stiff, they always are there. Um, and then you lift up the sight to its maximum setting. There's a nice little witness mark there. So you know where you're in the right place. All right, so I'll show you the last stroke of genius from Rudolf Schmidt concerning the Vetterli, and that is the trigger group for the 1881 Stutzer, which is now a very modern modular trigger pack. Now, in terms of function, it is identical to the previous Turi. Um, we have the same interrelation between uh, the front and the rear trigger, with the front one basically being accelerated when the rear trigger has been set 
and uh, this is now the new spring pushing down the rear one and uh, yeah it's a very very clever system it's also been helpfully numbered so you can uh, disassemble it and reassemble it rather easily so uh, well done Rudolf Schmidt now concerning the bayonets there was one tiny change which you can't see here uh, between the 1878 and the model 1881 the only difference is that the uh, cross guard is slightly thickened on the main part where at the junction with the blade this is from goes from six millimeters to seven millimeters and that is it and there is a one later pattern the uh, 1887 which is easily identifiable because it has three rivets instead of four so it has two top ones here and then just one at the bottom so i hope that run through of the rifles and stutzers was interesting and maybe it'll help you id what you have or what you're looking for or what you don't have yet um, aside from the rifles of course we have uh, cavalry carbines we have um, police short rifles border guard short rifles and cadet rifles as well so there's plenty should one want to have a vetterly collection uh, now i've left one out purposefully and that is the supposed 1878-81 rifle uh, I believe that to be a collector designation and I base that on the contents of the authoritative book on the subject. So if you are a serious Vetterli collector, you need this. It's in German, but uh, nowadays we've got some good translation tools. Um, it's out of print, but seems to have been a fair number printed and it's not terribly difficult to get hold of if you're prepared to pay because, of course, they're not cheap. Uh, this one was because it was missing its dust cover. Anyway, um, in this book is a complete list of changes for the Infantry Rifle series uh, and, and the Stutzers. Um, and under the 1878 section, it just says that from November 81, they get fitted with the 81 site. That's it. There's no indication that there is a change of designation. It's still an 1878 rifle. So uh, there we go. That's what I'm sticking to. So in this wonderful list of changes, there are, of course, a host of other very tiny, tiny changes. Um, changes in design of barrel bands, thicknesses, thinning in places, thickening in places, um, all sorts of stuff. And I've made a list of a couple of other things which we might find interesting. Uh, so first in July 1878, we have a switch from iron receivers to steel. They're still being uh, largely machined. But there's a note that in 1884 they changed to forged steel receivers, so they've made some progress in the machining. Um, the next question is the uh, application of bluing, because it seems very, very inconsistent. When you come across collections today, uh, you'll have two rifles which have bluing applied in different places. Uh, unfortunately, the tables don't really help. Uh, the only concrete information is that from November 1881, we have expansion of bluing to include the sight, uh, the bolt uh, cap and uh, spring cover, the bands and the sling swivel. Um, and there's a note that this, uh, that prior to this, it was only applied to the barrel and the receiver. Unfortunately, we don't know when the bluing was applied to the barrel and the receiver. So we don't know. And there's a final note on bluing uh, in uh, 1887, which states that the bluing is expanded to the internal components. So the lifting, lifting arm, uh, the lifter assembly, springs, trigger, and all that. Uh, and the last one, which I wanted to mention, was the addition of a spare striker fork in under the butt plate. Uh, this was done uh, from March 1882, uh, retroactively also for the 1878 rifles. Right, now I think we can uh, go on to the ammunition. So in most countries transitioned from muzzle loaders to breech loaders, they pretty much followed the same path. They would start with a conversion of the existing percussion arms with simple economics. Um, and these conversion systems would typically fire a metallic cartridge, which was basically uh, replicating the performance of the muzzle loading charge and projectile. And with this stopgap in place, they would select or develop their own dedicated uh, breech loading system and also take the opportunity to reduce the caliber to something typically in the 11 millimeter range, 45 cal. 
Now, Switzerland did things a bit differently. Um, they had already solved the caliber reduction all the way back in 1851, starting with the sharpshooters, of course, these fine gentlemen, because they get issued the wonderful 1851 Feldstutzer in 10.4 millimeters. Uh, now, this caliber isn't adopted by everyone straight away. Uh, there was some resistance from the chain of command, the, uh, the old guard who were perfectly happy with the 18 uh, millimeter. Um, but finally, the, uh, they get their way and uh, the Jaegers get their 10.4 rifles uh, from 1856 onwards and the infantry finally in 1863. So um, with a decree of July 1866, uh, Switzerland decides simultaneously to adopt a conversion system and a repeater, uh, but they already have their reduced caliber and they're very happy with the performance of the 10.4. They've got more than 10 years of experience with it. So uh, the 10.4 uh, by 38R is rapidly born, comes to be, and it basically, as these early cartridges do, they basically replicate the performance of the uh, muzzle-loading charge. Now, why did they go with a rimfire system? I have no definite answer, but I suspect that simply because it was a well-established uh, cartridge ignition system at the time. Um, there was uh, an industrial process for producing it. It was a uniform system. Um, they were certainly aware of center fire cartridges. In fact, uh, most of the Vetterli prototypes were apparently center fire. Um, but the center fire system was still in, in, in its uh, infancy, um, wasn't quite as reliable as it is now. Um, so I suspect they just went with what was well established and knew they, they, they could get up and running in industrial form. Um, so, as I mentioned in the 1881 rifle description, the ballistics and the performance of the cartridges remain incredibly stable throughout the entire series. There are only uh, four variants. They're all remfire. Um, the only centerfire ammo produced in Switzerland was for target shooting and hunting purposes only. Um, so yes, uh, the performance remains the same. We always have a 20 gram bullet. Uh, the muzzle velocity is uh, 335 meters per second. And three of the variants of black powder, which take uh, 3.6 to 3.76 grams of uh, number four powder, which equates to about 3F. And we have a last one where it transitions to smokeless with a PC89. Uh, but it, re it retains the same muzzle velocity. So uh, we'll just dive in quickly to the, th the four variants in question. So the first cartridge is the 1867 pattern. Uh, this has a classic round nose bullet, which is a of a heel design, as they all are. And the maximum diameter just forward of the heel is 11.1 millimeters. Uh, it has a hemispherical cavity and composed of soft lead and has four grooves. Now, why they choose the heel design, I don't know whether this is uh, a conscious choice or mere coincidence, uh, but it helps, of course, substantially um, when using tubular mags because it, it prevents, or at least helps to prevent, uh, the telescoping of, the, of bullets inside a case when you're stacking them one behind the other under spring pressure. But yeah, I've got no evidence either way. Now, the next one is the 1871 pattern. Now, this has a more... Uh, conical nose, it's a bit difficult to tell from the picture, but you can see from the drawing that uh, it's clearly got a, a more conical uh, nose. Uh, the maximum diameter has been reduced slightly, it's now 10.6 millimeters, and the uh, base cavity is now much deeper and is sort of a bell shape. Otherwise, otherwise it's still soft lead and retains its four grooves. Now in 1878 we have a substantial redesign of the bullet. We've got now uh, basically an entirely conical nose. Uh, the maximum diameter is 10.62, but now we have a patch which um, swells it out down to uh, 10.85 millimeters. And it is now composed of hard lead. Um, the base cavity is the same as the 71 pattern, so this bell shape. Okay, and the last pattern is the 1890 pattern. Looks like this. And I have sacrificed one for science. Now these are the new generation which are loaded with smokeless powder, PC89. And uh, this is 
what it looks like. So the uh, the bullet has not changed. It is the uh, 1878 pattern with this sort of onion skin patch, very very thin. And just to differentiate it from the previous pattern, they have an extra strip of paper just to uh, cover the junction between bullet and case. And the powder looks like this. And it's, uh, it's not very much. 1.25 to 1.45 grams of this stuff and just enough to reproduce the muzzle velocity of the black powder round. So this is still going at 435 meters per second. And uh, these are the typical Vesely ammunition packs. They always came in packs of 10. And uh, the smokeless ones very helpfully have this red stripe across them with PC-89. Not that it actually mattered in terms of safety for the rifles. It will be quite interesting to compare also the uh, bullet between the uh, last generation Vetterli GP90 and the first generation 7.5 GP90. You can see uh, certain similarities in the heel and the cavity between the two. So here's a small collection of other sources of uh, Vetterli ammunition. Uh, in the US there was the uh, Remington and Winchester. Uh, that was produced well into the 40s. Uh, there was a big influx of surplus Vetterli rifles and uh, they made you know, good truck guns. Uh, so uh, yeah, it made sense to have a, you know, a domestic production. Um, on the left is a uh, civilian production hunting cartridge, which is in the center fire. It says so. Jagd, Buxen, Patronen. Uh, that would be for Vetterli or uh, Martini rifles as well. And um, the one below it is, uh, is a bit odd. Uh, I, I didn't know this source. Uh, Italian produced, but for um, an American arms company. Um, perhaps the strangest of the lot is the uh, actual Swiss military package there from 1932, which is quite astounding since um, by that date, they'd even stopped producing the 7.5 GP90. So it's a bit of a puzzle as to why that batch was produced. Um, the ammo, military ammo was produced in batches. Uh, the most common you find today are the GP, uh, so the GP1890 uh, in the 1890s, uh, 91, 92 is particularly easy to find. Um, it seems from the documents I've found that they liked to keep a reserve of 200 rounds per man. Um, in terms of what they carried, I couldn't find an official number. However, based on the size of the magazine pouch and the size of the, ma of the packages compared to the previous uh, percussion cartridges, <clears throat> they're pretty much equal. And then uh, it was 60 rounds per man, so I wouldn't be surprised if that was maintained during the Vetterli era. So now over to a bit of shooting, as promised. Now the first bit is uh, some footage from the last day of shooting at the 300 meter range at Gimmelwald, the most beautiful range in the world. Uh, I thought it was symbolic to uh, shoot with a Vetterli, with black powder rounds, uh, since the first shots were most likely fired with uh, again with a Vetterli uh, all the way back in 1877. And um, as you'll see, once I've, I've dialed in, uh, it's perfectly adequate to shoot a uh, man-sized target at 300, even with the relatively low power round. And uh, the second bit is uh, a bit of a mad minuting with the Vetterli uh, that may or may not have already been released. Um, interesting to note that since actually doing that, uh, I found some some uh, training manuals and in there uh, there is a section on a uh, mad 30 seconds and the idea was that uh, you gave the men 15 rounds and they had 30 seconds to shoot as many as they could at a target at 225 meters so the minimum range on the sites and uh, there was no scoring or competition uh, all they would note in their shooting books was whether they hit uh, the figure or the, just the target and the idea was just to get them used to 
rapid firing should it be necessary, which was an interesting theory. Right. <laughs> okay, right yeah. height, just outside the scoring zone, yeah. to the right. And... And you're on. Let's uh, see the light here. Sight is... Oh, just over 400. Yeah. yeah. Through mag load. You're feeling confident? <laughs> I'll still do shot by shot, but... Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm confident they won't telescope. Yeah. Okay. I can hear it. There's a tick at the other end. Um, you reckon? They're going thunk through the paper. Yeah. Has that made contact? Yay! Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> 20. The old girl can still do it. 44. <laughs> so. Same, a little, a little lower and a little to the right, but just a touch now. <laughs> two far to the left. So that's the shot. <laughs> On the water line to the right. Yeah. Seventy. Oui. Huh? What? 70. 70 points. 70 points. So that's just whatever you did then, do it again. Do it again. <laughs> and I thought that was going to go left. Miss. Miss. There. Right. Yeah. Okay. To the right. So the last one now. Low right. Thirty. We. There you go. Nice. Thirty. Thirty points. For those who watch the Mad Minute vid, you got walking ramrod again. <laughs> It is a common thing. <laughs> yeah. Where are you
that was loads of fun, let me tell you. Now, of course, the uh, Vetterli is replaced by the Schmidt Rubin, model 1889. However, um, the Vetterli system played quite a large part in Edward Rubin's uh, cartridge experiments in small calibers. And even those do pop up now and again. Of course, they have a barrel chambered for something, um, you know, seven millimeter, eight millimeter, nine millimeter, um, who knows. Uh, they're usually a big mix of parts, but they do have one distinctive feature and that is a sort of open triangular rail on the back of the receiver just to support the bolt when uh, opening and closing. So we're almost at the end of the Vetterli story, but I couldn't quite let you go without mentioning the affair of the SS John Grafton of 1907. Now this was a cargo ship that was loaded, amongst other things, with at least 15,000 Vetterli rifles. Um, now these had been purchased on the surplus market, not directly from Switzerland. And um, this ship was destined for uh, Finland, uh, in particular to arm some more separatist movements. Um, Finland was still then a Russian province, and uh, the hope was that uh, these goods would help these factions instigate some kind of rebellion and distract uh, the Russians from the front against the Japanese because we're in the middle of uh, the Russo-Japanese War. And in fact, the whole operation had been organized by Japanese agents. Now, it wasn't really successful. Um, the ship did enter Finnish waters and a couple of drop-offs were made uh, however, then uh, at some point it grounded. Uh, the captain got the willies because the Russian Navy was patrolling, so he destroyed the ship and then the, the whole operation fell apart. Now, um, a couple of, you know, a couple of thousand perhaps rifles did make it ashore, uh, but they just got absorbed into local coastal populations. There's uh, boat guns, hunting guns, farm guns, whatever. Um, and in fact, they are known still known locally as the Grafton Kivari, if my pronunciation is correct. So uh, now we're really at the end of the story. I really thank you very much for uh, staying throughout these extremely long episodes and um, I hope you've learned something and um, I shall hopefully see you next time for something a bit shorter and in, in any case Thank you very much for all your support across all the platforms uh, that we uh, post stuff on. And thank you also, of course, particularly to our patrons, uh, which enable us to carry on. So thank you very much and see you next time.